We're going to look at the whole chapter. Yeah. Don't, don't panic. It only has six verses. Psalm 1. The book of Psalms actually begins, obviously, with Psalm 1. And it begins with a study in contrasts, differences. It pictures two men, or they could be two women. It's, you know, it's neutral as far as sex is concerned. Two individuals, men or women, who are totally different. We'll probably use the term men only because that's what the text uses. So understand, it's not just male. What we do get from this psalm is a description of these two people. One of them is a godly man. We get a description of him. The picture here is someone who is saved, someone who is born again, someone who is living for their Lord, that person. That's the first three verses. Then in the last three verses, we get three depictions of an ungodly man. The person who is lost. The person who knows not Christ. The person who has never been born again. All the things that we said about the godly man, it's just opposite with the ungodly. So we're going to begin and look at them in the order that we'll find them. And it begins with the godly man. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of of the scornful. Three things. Three things in that one verse. We're talking about three things that the godly man does not do. Does not do. He doesn't listen. Now let me finish. Because some of you think it must be my husband. He doesn't listen to ungodly men. That little phrase, he walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Counsel here means you go to someone, you're seeking advice. And that person responds by giving you advice. So the saved, godly man will not listen to the counsel of the ungodly. Now let me kind of put a little disclaimer here. Down through the years, in fact, we have one of our people here at the church that is been going through counseling with someone who is a trained specialist. He asked me my opinion. I told him I have no problem with it because this particular counselor, even though he is clinically, has all of the doctorates and everything else. He's also a Christian. And that makes a difference. 
So I'm not saying that particular person I'm talking about, that counselor is a Christian. But how far should we go as far as listening to counsel of those people who are not Christians? I don't doubt for a moment some could be very, very helpful. They don't, they don't get that degree by not being trained. They know the questions to ask. I don't know them. I have talked with this particular individual many times. He seeks out my advice, and I'm thankful for that. But I don't know. I don't claim to. I don't have a doctorate. I don't claim to know every little question that needs to be asked that will cause that person to open up. I don't have that. And in this particular case, it has worked. He told me about a week ago, he said, I've come to realize and admit things that have been in me for years and I really wasn't aware of them. And he knew what to say to bring that out. I don't have that. I can encourage him and give him counsel based on how I perceive the Word of God. And I think that's the first and number one counsel to receive. But I'm not going to be against someone particularly who goes out to a trained individual seeking help. So I wanted to say that first. But let's picture someone who is not. They, they give advice, but they have no relationship with God whatsoever. None. The only counsel they can give you is based on their schooling or what they have been taught or their own philosophies in life, their own depiction of life. That's all. I don't really trust that. I really don't. And I think that's what the psalmist is talking about here. He walks not in the counsel, advice of the person who's ungodly, the person who's lost. The person who's lost cannot understand the things of God. They can't. Because the scripture says they are motivated by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And if they're not saved, the Holy Spirit's just totally foreign to them. They have no understanding, no comprehension of it whatsoever. The godly man does not go to the ungodly and say, give me advice. Something else. He doesn't listen to ungodly men. He doesn't linger with sinful men. He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. First of all, he's standing. And the term path there means that he's kind of, in a way, fellowshipping with the unsaved. Now, down through the years, I've had friends. And perhaps you have too. Who, by their own admission, were lost. I'm not suggesting in any way we write them off. We don't have anything to do with them unless their lifestyle in some way is so far out there that it begins to affect us and our walk with Christ, it could be that God has us with them for a reason. 
we may be the only Bible that they ever read. So I'm not saying people that you know that are lost and need Christ. The psalmist said, just write them off the lift. Have nothing to do with them. No. No. Be open. Reach out to them and help them. Here is what the second part of this verse says. He does not walk in their path. The ungodly man will go places that the godly man won't and cannot go. It's always been a struggle for me down through the years because of my love for music. And I've had so many friends that played music uh, that was not Christian music. And because down through the years I have played a lot of that kind of music, uh, And I can tell you right up front, I'd probably sit down with some of them and enjoy a picking session. But I won't do it. Because I think it can potentially harm or hurt a witness. When the psalmist is talking about the godly man not standing in the way of sinners. He's talking about being in their presence, walking along with them, and he'll enlarge on this more in the third point. But the bigger thing is, he doesn't endeavor in the things that they're doing. We just have to draw the line sometimes. Can't do that. Which leads us to the third one. He doesn't listen to ungodly men. He doesn't linger with sinful men. And he doesn't laugh with scornful men. He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Notice the progression. It began with walking, right? Innocent. Taking a leisure stroll. But there's the potential to become more and more comfortable with that so we just come right beside of them. If they go to the pub or to the bar to have a drink, we go with them. We may not partake. But we realize it's a bad witness. Terrible. But then it progresses farther. It begins by just walking alongside. Then we stop and we're with them. And the last part is the biggest picture of all. We sit down at the seat of the scornful. That would be, could be the breaking point to sit down and see some of the things that are going on and think, I don't think that would harm me. And we all know that's how Satan works. I don't think that I would be affected by that. How many well-meaning Christian people have succumbed and fallen because they started doing something they thought, I can draw the line, I can control this but it overtook them. So many. So many. The godly man. Now look at verse 2. That's kind of the negative. That's three things he does not do. Now let's look at him from a positive standpoint. Verse 2. But his delight. Now everything changes. Up until this point, it's things he does not do. Now he talks about things that he does do. His delight is in the law of the Lord. 
and in his law, he meditates day and night. Now we see the relationship between the godly man and the Word of God. God's Word. The Word of God has captured his affection. He's literally fallen in love with the Word of God. His delight is in the law of the Lord. I fail in so many parts of the Christian life. But there's one part that I feel comfortable as far as this psalm is concerned. I love the Word of God. I really, really do. I can remember in a younger life, younger Christian life, that I would read the Word of God and much of it was because I knew that that's what I should be doing. The pastor was encouraging me to do that. My Sunday school teachers were encouraging that. Get in the Word of God. Read the Word of God. And I would read. And I would find things even then. Especially if it was a passage of Scripture, maybe out of the Old Testament, that had a storyline to it. I could get involved in it. But now to go and read some parts, particularly the Old Testament, which so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he begat so-and-so, and he begat so-and-so. It's God's Word. It's all there for a reason. They're showing lineage, by the way. But I'd read that, and I thought, I am not getting a whole lot out of this. Right? If it had a storyline, I could really get intrigued with it. As I got older, particularly as I started pastoring, I began to realize how important the Word of God was, not just because it supplied sermons, although that was part of it. I don't want to ever preach anything to you out of a Reader's Digest or an Almanac or anything else. If I preach to you, I'm going to preach to you out of the Word of God. I may refer to some other periodical, to some other author. That's different. But as far as its basis is concerned, keep it in the book. The godly man has just been captured by the Word of God. It has captured his affection. He loves it. And I can say with an honest heart, I love God's Word. I love it. And I think one of the most intriguing things about the Word of God to me is just how fresh it is. I have been reading the Word of God for years, a long time. And there are many times that I'll read a passage of Scripture or a story and I'll see something I have never seen before. Never. And I perhaps have read that passage many times. That's what we refer to as illumination. The Word of God is illuminated. It is a living book. It's alive. That's the reason it never wears out. Because the Holy Spirit, in conjunction with the Word of God, will point things out to us and show us things that we'd never seen. I don't know any other book that'll do that. So God, God's Word has captured His affection. Then it's claimed His attention. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law... He meditates day and night. I've used this illustration before. But I've heard in various messages, 
Dr. Rogers used it over and over and over, and if he can use it over and over and over, I think I can use it over and over and over. He used to talk about this thing of meditating in the Word. And he said, if you're a farm boy, and he was speaking of himself, first person, I am, I'm not. Nick's my farm boy. But he said, if you've ever noticed a cow, he said that cow will graze, and they have, I don't know how many stomachs, probably about as many as I do. And he will graze and graze, and he will pick all of this grass. And then that cow will sit down and start chewing and chewing. One of the things, personal note, one of the things, and I'm sure you'll be excited to know about it, one of the things, I've been having all kinds of stomach problems and they told me, chew your food. I liked it better in gulps. I could get another one quicker with a gulp. My stomach doctor told me that's a mistake. Chew your food. I have an ulcer right in the bottom of my stomach. And he says, by not chewing your food, it's going there and laying there. When I went for the last procedure, first thing he had to do was go down in there and take a lot of food that had been laying there for a long time. No wonder I was having such a hard time. I am doing better, by the way. Chew your food. Now, I'll have to admit, that's something I had to make myself do. I had to force myself. But it's working. Because I'll be honest with you, before that, before I started doing that, I thought, I've already chewed that. I'm not going to chew it anymore. That's yucky. Think about that cow chewing hours and hours and hours the same food. And eventually, it will allow that food to digest. And Dr. Rogers used that illustration when he talked about it. That's what the psalmist is talking about. How that he meditates on the Word of God. Chews the could over and over and over. Now you've got your farm report for the night. Move to verse 3. We're still talking about the godly man. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Whoso leave also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Quickly, five things. His prominence. The godly man, his prominence. He shall be like a tree. I think all of us at some point, some more than others, but all of us respect the beauty of a tree. A big oak tree, for example. We can almost back up in awe and see that stately tree. It's beautiful. It's prominence. I think this past fall, in my opinion, was one of the prettiest falls that we have had in a long time. Phyllis and I took several trips just looking at trees. It was beautiful. He shall be like a tree, like the mighty oak. It's permanence. He shall be like a tree planted. Planted. Depending on the variety of trees, 
since we've been having a lot of wind, sometimes those trees will be uprooted. We, uh, we set out years ago up in the upper part of the yard uh, three pear trees, beautiful trees, beautiful. But evidently they are so soft because on two occasions the whole side, and they grew fast, and that may be another reason that they do, the whole side come out of one tree twice. And my little beagle happens to be up there about where those trees are because it's shady. I think when that thing come down, it didn't hit her. But I think it really, really tore her up. It shall be like a tree planted. There are certain types of trees that the wind can come and it would take a a hurricane or something to blow some of those trees down because they are so deeply rooted. The roots go way, way down into the soil and they withstand whatever comes their way. Now he's comparing this to the godly man. His prominence. I've looked upon men and women down through the years that I've had the privilege of pastoring and I've just admired them. Their permanence, they're always there. No matter what comes along, they don't waver. Then their position, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now that, that makes a pretty scene to see a beautiful tree near a very slow moving river that's beautiful but there's more benefits because of that water source that tree has got a full supply all the time and as long as that water source is there even though it may go down that tree will withstand because it's planted by the water and in this sense, I think we can picture the Lord Jesus Christ being the water of our life who sustains us in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. His productivity, a tree that brings forth its fruit in its season. The godly man who has fallen in love with the Word of God, right? knows from reading the Word of God that there are things he or she are to be involved in or to be soul winners. Now, in the case of the tree, it's natural fruit, whatever it is, if it's a fruit tree. And even if it isn't, it brings forth its leaves. It's productive. And the godly man who is by the river because he loves the word of God so much he's constantly encouraging others continually trying to win others to his Savior then his prosperity last his leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper his prosperity. Let me say this about this particular portion. A lot of people read this and think, I've known people, godly people, who struggled all of their life financially. They had very, very little. Seemed like there was setback after setback after setback. They had very little. Let me tell you something to keep in mind. 
Prosperity as it relates to the world is one thing. Prosperity as it relates to God can be something totally different. And I'm really, and God has blessed us and I thank Him for it, but I'm really not really concerned about how the world views me or my family as far as prosperity is concerned. God has supplied our needs and actually many of our wants. Perhaps things we didn't really need, but we wanted. An old money pick truck. Things that we like. God views prosperity completely different. And I'm not so concerned about how the world views us as far as prosperity is concerned. We're doing fine. I'm much more concerned about how God views us. And He's blessed us immensely. All right, that's the godly man. We'll move on. Now, we'll not devote as much time to the last three. The last three verses, I said earlier on, this is a psalm of contrast. It's showing differences. The difference between the godly and the ungodly. Now we move to the ungodly man. And there's three things about him in close. It'll be verses 3, 4, and 5. First, he's driven. Now, when I say that, I don't want to give you the ideal that uh, we should not be people who are focused, people who have an agenda. I'm not saying that. We shouldn't do that. In fact, I think it's wrong not to do that. But we've got to keep in mind that whatever our agenda is and whatever our focus is, it must be in the bounds of the will of God. And the ungodly man, he's driven. But that which is driving him is not right. Look at verse 4. The ungodly are not so. Now, basically, that's a throwback to what he's talked about in the first three verses, the godly man. He said, the ungodly are not so. There's the contrast. But are like the shaft, which the wind drives away. Chaff is a little husk on grain. You've seen it. And when the wind blows and that grain is up and mature, you can see it. If the wind blows hard, if you look, you can see it. It looks almost like snow. The wind blowing that chaff away. And the psalmist compares the ungodly man to that chaff. He's driven. He's blown away. By design. That chaff is not to stay on the grain. So the wind comes by and takes care of it. Blows it away. Driven. It gets worse. He's not only driven, but he's doomed. Look at verse 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. That little phrase in the first part of that verse needs some explanation. For it says, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Now, if you just read over that, and just take it on perhaps what your mind is telling you that this is saying. 
you might actually assume that lost ungodly people will never have to stand before God. Nothing could be farther from the truth. In fact, everyone, everyone will stand before Christ. Two different places, two different times, and two different reasons for standing before Him. But we'll all stand. The godly will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We will answer, we will account for the type of disciple that we have been from the moment that we are converted till our last day on earth. By the way, anything that's in your history, <laughs> anything that happened before you got saved, you'll never have to answer for that. Never. Never. From the moment we're saved on, that all changes. Will that determine whether we go to heaven or not? No. Absolutely not. No, we're guaranteed of heaven. If we have been born again, we're guaranteed. But we will answer. There will be accountability. Some people label Baptists this way all the time. I mentioned it the other day. You Baptist people think you're just eternally secure. You can go out and live any other way. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I want to live my life for Christ to the best of my extent because of what Christ has done for me. He deserves that. I owe Him that. Because you see, He bought me. He paid the price when He sent His Son to die for me at Calvary. Now what that verse means, He had just shown this picture of this chaff, the wind coming by and blowing it away. He just painted that picture. They're driven and they're doomed. They will not be able to stand. Why? Because the wind is stronger. They have no anchor. None. They will be blown away. It gets worse. He's driven, he's doomed, and he's damned. This is the worst part of all, verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly, here it is, shall perish. That's the end. That's the end result. That's when the ungodly man has gone as far as he can go. He's doomed. He's doomed. Put together a sermon outline. I've been finishing it up. And it talks about this very, very fact. There will be no second chances for a lost person. Ever how we leave this world Ever what our spiritual condition is when we leave this world, which basically comes down to what we have done with Christ. However we leave this world will be determined where and how we stand before God. The believers, I told you, will be at the judgment seat of Christ, but there is a judgment called Great White Throne Judgment. It's horrible. It's horrible. Where the final verdict, God will say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart. And they will be cast into a lake of fire with Satan and all of his legions. Sad. Sad. In that one chapter, 
chapter 1 is a perfect picture of all of mankind. There are those who are saved. That's the godly. And I'm glad to be in that number, aren't you? But there are multitudes of others all around us who are not. They're lost. God help us to get a burden for those because, and I don't think my family's any different than yours, a lot of them are in our own families, right? We need to do everything we can to win them to Christ. Let's stand.